Hi, my name is Matt and this is my YouTube channel, Matt in a Hat. This is a discussion and information channel for Pathfinder 2nd Edition, an epic tabletop role-playing game from the talented folks at Paizo. Please remember to like, subscribe and ring the bell below for notifications. And if you're feeling extra generous or want to chat about anything in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, please leave a comment, even if it is just hashtag for the algorithm. So I have decided to spend each week talking about monsters from different challenge ratings, all the way from minus 1 to 25. Each week I will spotlight a creature or group of creatures from one challenge rating higher than the previous week, until I have done one creature from each challenge rating, then I will start again at minus 1. This week I start at creature minus 1 with two specific types of gremlin, Grimple and Hanover. Both of these can be found in Bestiary 3. Now on to some lore. Gremlins are cruel fey tricksters and saboteurs who have fully acclimated to life on the material plane, finding distinct niches for their inventive destructiveness. All gremlins delight in ruining or breaking things, whether it's something physical, like a device, or a vehicle, or something intangible, such as an alliance, or even a relationship. A gremlin's greatest joy is watching the collapse of complex creations, preferably after the lightest and slightest carefully targeted push from the gremlin. Gremlins tend to denigrate, bully, or even slaughter their lesser kin, particularly mitflits, whom gremlins and many others derisively call mites. The mischievous fae known as gremlins seem to come in endless varieties with differing appearances. Preferring to destroy rather than to build, gremlins almost never construct their own homes. Instead, they infest tunnels and abandoned buildings. They augment their lairs with cruel traps and sometimes trained animals, often ones considered pests by humanoids. Gremlin lairs are generally near a city or a village, whether on the surface or in the dark lands. That provides them with a ready source of food, trap building materials and, of course, victims for entertainment. There is little difference in appearance between male and female gremlins, and many observers wrongly assume that they are single gender or genderless. Gremlins are prolific breeders, and a handful can quickly become a mob. Young gremlins are raised communally, a necessity as they exhibit the urge to cause mischief from birth. They grow quickly and reach full size in a matter of weeks. Gremlins arose long ago in the first world, living embodiments of nature's ability to wear away, erode and decompose. <clears throat> On the material plane, their encounters with mortal civilizations twisted them into creatures devoted to chaos, sabotage, and traps, each variety specializing in a particular brand of mayhem. So, on to Grimples first. Even more than most gremlins, Grimples resent the trappings of civilization. In common rooms with their rowdy sing-alongs, Livery yards with their whinnying horses, church steeples with their clanging bells. Grimples live to spoil these conventions, dropping tavern signs on patrons, urinating in rain barrels, and opening stable doors. When all else fails, they literally vomit their disdain on passers-by. Grimples resemble humanoid, mange-ridden opossums, with boar-like tusks that aid them in rooting through garbage heaps for food. They are agile climbers who glide from eave to eave on the loose flaps of skin between their limbs. Savvy gremlin hunters know to look for the skin flakes and fur grimples shed 
from their parasite infested hides. On to Hanover. Hanovers are actually the most benign types of gremlin. Capricious fae who skim the waves on rubbery fin wings. Hanover's incessant curiosity compels them to examine any object that draws their attention. Such treasures might include an overturned fruit basket, a sack of coins, or a shark's gleaming teeth, often still in the shark's mouth, to the fae's regret. Should Hanover's like what they find, they steal it making them a bane to fishers and dock workers everywhere. Sailors sometimes affix a Mary Hanover to their ship's prow, made from the, a raised dried carcass. This clever bit of taxidermy resembles a dead Hanover, enough to scare gremlins away. But should a Hanover wise up to the ruse, it will stop at nothing to torment its would-be deceivers. Now, all gremlins no matter the type, are hoarders. And Hanovers and Grimples, they're just the same. Their nests are cluttered with objects both valuable and worthless. Sorting through a gremlin nest can reveal unexpected treasures like pieces of jewellery, minor magic items, but care must be taken to avoid being cut on rusty shards of metal, picking up cursed items, or disturbing a hidden nest of venomous vermin. Lawful evil gremlins are sometimes drawn to worship of archdevils, though not in an orthodox fashion. Dispater is revered as the archdevil of cities, playgrounds to engage in thievery and sabotage. Mammon is also worshipped as the bringer of wealth and protector of goblin warrens that, like his domain of Erebus, are dark and trap-filled. Neutral evil gremlins have been known to worship Norgoba in his aspect as a patron of thieves. But Pugwumpies in particular prefer to worship gnolls. Or at the very least, worship whoever the local gnolls worship. Chaotic evil gremlins often revere Andirifku, demon lord of illusions, knives and traps. Those that retain a connection to the First World may swear allegiance to the Lantern King, eldest of laughter, mischief, and transmutation. On to the abilities. So, firstly, Grimples. And here we have a Screenshot of the rule book uh, of Bestiary 3. So, Grimples are creature minus one. They have a high dexterity and constitution. Their wisdom is moderate and they have a low charisma. Their skills are high crafting, especially for traps, which is actually extreme. High stealth and thievery. And they have moderate nature and, and low deception. They have a high armor class and reflex save as well. Their fortitude and willpower saves are both moderate. They do have high hit points, but as with most uh, gremlins, they do have a weakness too to cold iron. They are very slow, especially on land, uh, with a speed of only 10 feet. Very slow. They have slow climb speeds and fly speeds, but a little bit faster than on land. Their melee and range strike attack bonuses are both in the high category, and the damage is also high for its level. The Grimple has Grease as a primal innate first level spell, which can be cast just once, and it has a high DC of 16. They also have Mage Hand and Prestidigitation 
as primal innate cantrips and we'll be talking about those very shortly. I want to just mention a little bit about stealth. So being that their stealth is high they can conceal an object quite easily they can take the hide action and the sneak action and have a fairly good bonus when doing those things. Best with a Grimple to make sure that most rounds you're hiding or sneaking into cover and keep them uh, away or hidden uh, from the party as much as possible. Another thing to consider is that their thievery is also quite high. So they can palm an object, they can steal, they can disable a device, and they can pick a lock as long as they have the thieve tools requirement, which being that they pick up all sorts of things everywhere they go, they probably do. So onto their specific abilities. We do have a, a passive ability here uh, called Gremlin Lice. And basically, uh, whenever something is touched or is touched by the Grimple, they must succeed at a DC 13 reflex save. That's a moderate check. Or be infested by lice which itch and cause stupefied one. Now, there's more obviously in the flavor text than that, but that's basically what uh, they do. Uh, the stupefied condition does impede some spellcasters, and um, it's just really awkward. Um, you can spend an action to scratch and stop the stupefied condition, but uh, it's, it's pretty nasty. And then they do have an active ability, a one action putrid vomit. Lovely. So with their putrid vomit, they take an action. They spew their vomit 30 feet in a line. And any creature in that line needs to make a DC 16 fortitude save, which is a high DC, or become sickened. Now, they can only do this every 1d4 rounds, so keeping them hidden and going into cover in the in-between rounds is really helpful as they can just keep on making things sickened um, time and time again, which can be really gross. Uh, so I did promise that we would talk about Grease. Now Grease is a first level uh, primal spell in this case. It does have a range of 30 feet. The area is four squares that are all joined to each other, so contiguous squares. And basically it has a duration of a minute and you conjure Grease um, either in the area, on solid ground, or on a target. So if you target an area with grease, each creature standing on the surface needs to make a reflex save or an acrobatics check against the DC of 16 in this case, which again is high, and um, if they fail, they fall prone, uh, which is great because you start getting flanking bonuses for um, being flat-footed, all sorts of stuff. Creatures using an action to move onto the greasy surface must attempt that reflex save or acrobatics check to balance there. And creatures that step or crawl don't have to make the check. If, uh, instead of the area, uh, a target, which can be an unattended object, is, um, is targeted by the grease spell, anyone trying to pick that um, item up 
must make that acrobatics or reflex save to actually pick up the the target uh, object and um, on a failure the holder or wielder of uh, if the attend if the object is actually attended um, they take a minus two to all checks that involve the object so you can target an attended uh, weapon or some other tool that the party is trying to use um, and they take a minus two to using that item which can be the difference between making a hit or not so there's all sorts of things um, the only caveat here is if the spell is cast on a worn object the wearer gains a plus two to fortitude saves against attempts to grapple them you probably don't want to be trying to grapple somebody as a grimple anyway but that is just something to keep in mind a quick note uh, on mage hand and prestidigitation just because these are the spells that they have uh, mage hand is a two action spell it is sustained you can create a single magical hand you can manipulate it move it slowly you can sustain the spell and move it extra you can target an object with a bulk of one or less pick it up manipulate it throw it in the water do what you want without getting too close and personal as far as prestidigitation goes again it's a two action spell it has a range of 10 feet it targets an object again it's sustained and you can warm flavor or cook um, materials that are non-living you can lift objects you can um, basically make an object look crude uh, fragile uh, create something uh, temporary of negligible bulk or you can tidy up or mess things up uh, all sorts of things um, you can't use it to deal damage or cause adverse conditions um, and any actual change to an object persists only as long as you sustain the spell so you can't permanently change something it's just something that your uh, sustain action will uh, will cause so there's some pretty interesting interactions with those abilities and we're actually now going to move on to the Hanover. So now we are over at the Hanover. And we can see that uh, we have a high dexterity, a moderate constitution and charisma and a low intelligence we have high acrobatics stealth and thievery with thievery actually being extreme and a moderate deception and nature that deception could really come in handy and we'll talk about that in just a moment uh, we have high hit points high armor class our reflex save is high, we have moderate fortitude and lowish willpower saves. With our high hit points, we still have our weakness too to uh, cold iron, just like the Grimple. And very slow land speeds yet again with fly speed and actually quite a decent swim speed. We have moderate melee strike bonuses with high damage. We have fear and ventriloquism as primal innate first level spells but the DC of those spells is only 13 which is a moderate DC we uh, so we also have precipitation as a primal innate cantrip so a little bit about acrobatics here um, because our acrobatics is is quite high being able to balance tumble through and squeeze is something that can be very helpful and with our deception uh, of course they could lie 
um, but more importantly, Fane, uh, which is a great uh, use of an action to try and cause people to be flat-footed, um, even when they're not flanked. So great uh, interactions there. Um, our deception is only moderate, but even still, uh, that's a fairly high likelihood that you're going to manage to cause uh, combatants to be flat-footed. They have a great little ability here, which is rearrange possessions. Oh my goodness, this is actually amazing. So with one action uh, against a creature that is not on guard or in combat, or two actions against a creature who is, the Hanover attempts to steal an object from a person. And keep in mind, our, our thievery is extreme. It's at a plus seven, which is insane. If the Hanover succeeds, they can also rearrange pockets, pouches, and other containers of the person's inventory, extending the time it takes to retrieve their items. Normally, it would be just an action to retrieve any of the items that you have. However, after a Hanover successfully steals anything off you, you then have to take two actions to interact with any of your gear. It makes it uh, <laughs> quite interesting. And what is beautiful about this is that if they do take the two actions to do this against a creature who is on guard or in combat, they do not take the usual minus five penalty to steal a closely guarded object. That is insane. So they don't get a minus, <laughs> minus five penalty. It's huge. They don't take that. They can just do it with their full bonus. Really, really annoying ability, but fantastic. So, um, on that, probably what we should do is talk about fear. Now, fear is one of those things that modifies everything if the target uh, fails. So, uh, you can impose minus ones or even minus twos on everything of uh, the enemy. So we're talking armor class, we're talking saves and checks. It's amazing. So fear is pretty damn good. Unfortunately for the Hanover, it is only a moderate DC of 13 but it's still worthwhile doing and getting those uh, bonuses or inferring those negatives on an en enemy is really good. We're going to move on now to interactions. So, Interactions. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Grimple allies. So, Vex Gits, which are in Bestiary 2, and Grimple sometimes team up to cause ruin. They squat in abandoned clock or bell towers. Uh, they have uh, insectile Vex Gits, which use cranky Grimples to lure victims into elaborate death traps. Left to their own devices, Grimples bully mitflits or train giant rats and spider swarms to do their bidding. So there's some really great interactions that can happen when uh, either Grimples are by themselves or with Vexkits and specifically with Vexkits as they squat in these clock towers and bell towers and they can lure things in into a trap and it's pretty damn good. Now, a, an outside interaction here is with Gremlin Bells. 
So some superstitious societies hang tiny bells made of semi-precious metals uh, out in the open. They have a belief that such bells could persuade, uh, dissuade rather, gremlins from destroying the affixed object or infesting a home. So it's a, a ward. Strangely enough, most gremlins actually believe the superstition as well. And even when a gremlin bell hasn't been magically enhanced, a gremlin usually won't risk tinkering with objects that seem to be protected in such a manner. So you might have certain uh, structures that are protected by this or these superstitions. And let's talk a little bit about gremlin minions. Most people are no better than to employ gremlins. So when the fey creatures live side by side with others, it's often as parasites and unwelcome guests. Imaginative and sinister folk who find themselves infested sometimes catch the gremlins and release them in the homes of their enemies. So the PCs might have gotten on the wrong side of someone who has a bit of a, a nasty streak. They go off, capture some gremlins, or maybe employ some that they've captured previously and uh, get them to go into the uh, characters' rooms in an inn or homes if they own them. So there's some really interesting interactions that can happen with gremlins. They are just some, but there are many. Let's move on to scenarios. The weary, off-rhythmic splash from oars resounded in the encroaching mist that signalled to the fishermen that it was time to make for the shore. It was late in the day anyway, their nets already bulging with the fruits of their labour, and once this fog set in, there would be no reprieve this night. Calloused, practised hands, prepared moorings, adjusted nets, and guided their vessels toward home. This could be just one of the many, many, many settings you could employ gremlins in. Uh, and we have here a small fishing village. There might be some inns, places for the party to stay. The characters could have been assisting the fishermen with an aquatic monster, perhaps a threat on an island, or studying an environmental anomaly and be with them on the boats when the Hanover start messing with their stuff, especially if the, uh, if the fishermen have caught something that is especially shiny, if they've you know, gotten a corpse of some sort of monster that, um, that looks rather nasty, maybe the gremlins are interested in poking it, and um, yeah, if the if there's different people on there with different stuff that the gremlins are used to seeing, perhaps they pick on them in that case. Or, after a long day of adventuring, only wanting to rest in the local tavern, the characters could face up or face off, face off against a nasty group of grimples. The grimples could have urinated in the water barrels, they could be assaulting commoners on the street with tavern signs or rotted food from the trash. There could be trash spread through the streets, making it really difficult to walk through. They could be luring people into other buildings, setting up traps, all sorts of really interesting things right at the end of the adventuring day when the party is already tired and worn out. And this can definitely be an interesting one or even in the middle of the night the party are trying to get some sleep very early in the morning these things would definitely uh, rile them up and could be really interesting scenarios to employ these creatures and finally we're going to be talking about challenge
So, for a level 1 party of 4 characters, 2 of either the Grimple or the Hanover is a trivial threat. 4 of either creature is a moderate threat. 6 is a severe threat. And 8 is an extreme threat. In my homebrew games, which are made for newer players, I would consider 3 of either creature being a moderate threat and 4 being a severe threat. And for a level 2 party of 4 characters, 4 of either creature is a trivial threat, 8 is a moderate threat, 12 is a severe threat. And again, in my homebrew games, I would use the threats as presented for level 1 characters for this level 2 party to measure the difficulty. And that is about it. It has actually worked out to be a longer video than I first planned, but that's okay. I really appreciate you watching. Please remember to like, subscribe, ring the bell below for notifications. And if you're feeling extra generous or want to chat about anything in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, please leave a comment, even if it is just hashtag for the algorithm. My next video will be on Thursday and will address the acrobatics skill. I hope you will tune in then and also next Monday for the next installment of Monster Mondays. I'll see you then.